Hey, so while I was processing this, I realized that Google Hangouts kind of cut off all the introductions that we did. So just to bring you up to speed, we have Worshipful David Riley, a uh, past master from Massachusetts, now living in Florida. We have Worshipful Ted Graham, a past master from Massachusetts. We have Micah Fox, a brother from Massachusetts. And we have myself, Brother Nicholas Harvey from Massachusetts, also living in Florida now. Worshipful David Riley started episode two talking about religious tolerance in masonry and features an article that he had wrote himself. You can find that on our website. Okay, you're entirely brought up to speed. Let's get started. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about religious liberty. Freemasonry has often been attacked for a variety of reasons. Some of these attacks are the result of ignorance or misunderstanding. Others, however, are based entirely on the truth. One such attack is the accusation that we accept men of all faiths, encouraging each, man, encouraging each man to be true to his own religion, and that we prohibit proselytizing in our lodges. This is true. In most Masonic jurisdictions, the sole re religious requirement is that the petitioner affirm his belief in the Supreme Being. In others, there is a requirement for a monotheistic faith. In any case, once that question has been answered, the fraternity's interest in the particulars of a man's religious belief comes to an end. In lodges, sectarian religion is one of the two topics generally prohibited by our long-standing laws and customs. The other, of course, is politics. The first Jewish man of whose initiation as a Mason, we have a solid contemporary record, is Edward Rose, a successful snuff merchant. I have no idea why it amuses me so much that he was a snuff merchant, but it does. He joined a lodge in England in 1732. We are certain, however, that there were Jewish members of English lodges before then. Indeed, the master of the lodge that made Rosa Mason had a last name that would lead us to believe he probably was a Sephardic Jew. But Rose is the first brother for whom a written record exists, affirming both that he was a Mason and that he was a, of the Jewish faith and that was contemporaneous with his being made a Mason. It would be more than 100 years before a Jewish man could vote, hold public office, or serve on a jury in England, all those activities requiring a Christian test oath. I have been in Lodge and seen men of all three Abrahamic faiths, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, join together in prayer. There are tragically few places in the world where that happens. And I've seen, and while the central mythos of Freemasonry is derived from the Hebrew scriptures, I've seen men who were not of Abrahamic faiths, theistic Buddhists and Hindus, drive meaning and understanding from our mythology. Our craft has been practicing religious tolerance since before that phrase existed. And if that is an accusation against us, then I suggest that it is one that we should embrace. If that is a reason for a man not to join our fraternity, then I should be very grateful to him if he would, in fact, not join and encourage all who share his views to likewise refuse to enter our doorways. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about religious tolerance and Freemasonry and why it's an important value. Nick, what have you seen of religious tolerance in, in the fraternity? So my time with visiting lodges in both Massachusetts well, mainly in Massachusetts, I think religion doesn't come up almost at all, um, not inside the lodge. And I think the only time I've ever heard people discuss their religion was um, when we were hanging out outside of a lodge setting, just fellowshipping and people had questions on a religion or another, but we talked about it um, academically almost and the beliefs and what it means and why someone would believe that um in florida i think it's a little bit more christian leaning um i've seen inside of a lodge uh i don't think i've ever seen a different vo nope i've seen a different volume of sacred law once and that was the quran um but that was only for a few moments and then it went back to the holy bible so, <laughs> Ted, you have was a comment? Was it like a, like a, like a peekaboo like moment? Like, uh, do I have this too? Um, the gentleman was Muslim, uh, and that's where he swore upon his oath. 
Um, and he only used it for that. And then. So they, they put it out for that and then took it away immediately right. afterwards. Right. And it went back to the Holy Bible, which is at the center of, I would say, 99% of Masonic lodges when they meet. Yeah. I, it's interesting because there are a lot of lodges and an increasing number of lodges in a variety of jurisdictions that put out a variety of volumes of sacred laws. It's sacred law. Just um, all open on the altar at the same time, whether or not there's a particular person in that lodge that adheres to that particular volume or not. What do they put out in Massachusetts at your lodge? My lodge always has the Holy Bible open on the altar and uh, Tanakh and uh, Quran sort of to the side of the altar. And then if we have a candidate, those go on the altar, but they stay there for the entire time. So you've seen four or five different volumes of sacred law. I've seen three. Three. Okay. Yeah. We had one indication where one candidate was Muslim, one candidate was Jewish, and we had uh, a couple of candidates that were either, um, as I as I put it, Christian or generally confused theists. <laughs> and so they, you know, so all three volumes were out on the altar. I've never seen anything used other than those three, mm -hmm. but I know that in some jurisdictions they put out a variety of others. We had a Hindu candidate who said he'd be perfectly comfortable swearing on a Christian Bible that as far as he was concerned, it was all the same thing. I, I seem to remember seeing um, a Hindu text among the other um, volumes of sacred law that were put out sometimes um, in the lodge. But I know as a, as a new Mason, as someone who literally just sort of walked off the street during one of the open houses. It was one of the first things I noticed when I came into the lodge room that there were all the different uh, Bibles. And I think it, even just from a visual standpoint says a lot about the, the tolerance within the lodge, that that's something that's always out. So I want to get back to that. But while I was, while we did uh, mention the Quran, Ted, you're a practicing Muslim. Are you, is that correct? Mm -hmm. I'm a Sufi. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm practicing. Sorry. Um, yeah. You know, I most often describe myself as a wandering Sufi. Um, now, for the people listening, including myself, that have no idea what that is, can you explain it a little bit? So there are, so the, the Sufi schools of thought are, depending on who you'd ask, would be accepted as either Muslim uh, to the more liberal side of Islam or uh, complete heretics to the more conservative side of Islam. Um, Sufis are more often described as the mystics of Islam. Um, and the, the various schools uh, practice within the theories of uh, following the language of God rather than simply what is written, um, continuously listening to the language of God. Uh, whether it be uh, through musical experience, through mathematical experience, or through mystical experience. Um, as, a, as a wandering Sufi, I don't necessarily commit myself to any of the schools um, that are traditionally known. Um, while I was living in Egypt, you know, I was exposed uh, first to the Islamic community and then second to the Sufi, Sufi community uh, through, the, through the musical elements. Um, and, you know, that's most traditionally recognized, um, and at least people immediately recognize the, the whirling dervishes in Turkey as being what they think all Sufis are. Um, I would like to say I have never spun around in circles until I have heard the voice of God, um, but I have seen it done. Um, and it is a, a fairly powerful experience to see somebody experience that. Um, you know, uh, we tend to branch out into science and theology much more than is dogmatically accepted in most Islamic schools of thought. Uh, so, you know, we are very often considered either non-Muslim or, you know, very fringe Muslim. We've had a, a number of Muslim brothers in my mother lodge. I, um, and I mean, they've all been, and because they joined the fraternity, They've all been from the more liberal side of Islam, almost, I mean, by definition. Yes. But um, I think a lot, you know, given the, given the present environment, I think a lot of Americans are surprised that, one, there's a liberal wing of Islam. <laughs> uh, 
And that two, there's a long the majority of it. Yeah. And that there's a long tradition of religious tolerance in Islam as well. There is indeed. Uh, you know, I, and it is, it's, it's kind of enlightening to hear you say that and then just stop. Because most people say, oh, there's religious tolerance when they made Christians wear this color and Jews wear this color and everybody had to have a badge. And you know, <laughs> people are quick to point out this very finite period of time during one very strict, you know, imperial sect of Islam when they were ruling. Um, but one of the central tenets, you know, of the foundation of Islam is the fact that uh, what they call the Ahl Kitab, the people of the book, are, are God's chosen people. And the people of the book is not the Quran. It's uh, the people of the Abrahamic faiths. Um, so beginning with the Torah and arching through the Bible and into the Quran. Right. I think, I, yeah, I, I think there's a, I think there's a tendency to want to view the most visible parts of any religion as being the whole of that religion, unless you're inside of it. So what people see are the most extreme versions of every religion from the outside. Oh, absolutely. And that's the easiest way to look at it, isn't it? Yeah, it's certainly Christianity has had its moments of intolerance in its history as well. But when you're, in, when you're inside that religion, you're like, oh, well, that was an aberration. That's not what it means. But when you're outside that religion, it's much clearer to see it as being a part of that, con uh, of that faith. Um, Micah, going back to our earlier, sorry, not to cut off Micah, um, but talking about, or I used to visit a lodge in Washington, DC uh, when I was there more often than not for work. Um, and they always had the Holy Bible open at the center of the lodge, but they had the Bhagavad Gita, the Torah, the Quran, and there was a fifth book, and I wish I could remember what it was. Um, but I've noticed that in, Washington, in most Washington, D.C. lodges, that's very common, and actually in the house of the temple, they are permanently open in the, the primary lodge room. Um, and I can't, I still can't remember what the fifth book is, but I remember the last time I was at the house of the temple, I remember they were arranged with the, the Bible, had the Holy, the Holy Bible at the center, and then there was a pillar at each of the four cardinal points with a different volume of sacred law open on it. Yeah, I, I, recording. Freemasonry didn't start out with Hi, Jeremy. tolerance being a simple value. But I think it has slowly permeated the fraternity in a way that's kind of surprising. And I think it's still working its way through our value system, um, becoming more and more a part of what we how we how we think and how we act you know if you were in england in 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 1680 you probably had very little experience with people of other faiths so you didn't think about religious tolerance other than within a sectarian construct within christianity but as people become exposed to other faiths and um become more sensitized to that in a cross-cultural experience, then all of a sudden we have a, a greater accommodation for people of different religious faiths. Micah, Judaism has, I, my experience is that Judaism has a, a, a religious intolerance, a religious tolerance bordering on religious indifference towards other faiths. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, that most, right. yeah, you know, the old joke that the the most goyish thing you can do is convert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that sounds about right. Um, I think if we spend enough time trying to figure out our own faiths that we don't particularly care what other people think, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, and that, you know that's actually very very similar to my position as a mason is that I have, enough, I have enough of a job trying to be faithful to my faith, never mind trying to please other people. <laughs> That's Sounds really about right. Um, yeah, it's funny for me with uh, Judaism coming into the fraternity, I for a lo had always been interested in Masonry, but for a very long time, correctly thought that Masonry was only for Christians. Um, and I just didn't know. I just wasn't... Uh, 
wasn't educated on the fact um, there's masonry in my family, but it was on the Christian side um, of my family. And my grandfather was the last Mason and he had passed away before I was interested in it. So it was a, um, it was a real, uh, you know, pleasant surprise for me to find out that it was uh, an all inclusive um, <laughs> a fraternity that I could join. Right. And what was it like, what was the experience of joining like? in terms of of being a Jew joining did you like when you told people that you knew you know family members or whatever who are Jewish when you told them that you were becoming a Mason did they think it was only for Christians did they question you about that yeah absolutely it was I definitely got a few oh do they know you're Jewish <laughs> uh, to, to which I had to explain yeah yes they know that's that's totally okay I feel like I end up saying a lot no no it's it's okay there's actually a lot of jews in mason <laughs> uh, it's, i'm not the only one or i haven't somehow slipped in under the radar uh that sort of thing <laughs> and from the masonic side I, I mean did do you think the experience was any different at, because you're jewish um i definitely i liked all the old uh, how much sort of connections to the Old Testament there are in Masonry, I think was definitely um, maybe appealed to me a little bit more because it just reminded me of a lot of the lessons I learned um, in Hebrew school. Um, the, the irony was never lost on me that I, my mother lodge is located two blocks from where I went to Hebrew school. So it does always have this sort of, uh, <laughs> brings me back to, to those times. Um, and I think it's just having, been in places in my life where I've been, you know, offices where I was the only Jew or, um, you know, uh, other situations where I've always felt like an outsider. It was really wonderful being part of an organization where that was not only sort of accepted, but in some ways almost celebrated or something that was, didn't matter in the best possible way, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Has that been, is that similar to your experience, Ted? Uh, it has been, uh, you know, I, you know, I had a similar experience to Micah in that, you know, I had always heard that Freemasons were Christians. Um, and I know that in some countries that's still the rule. Um, but I was pleased uh, and very surprised to find that, you know, that was absolutely not the rule in the United States, uh, especially not in Massachusetts. Uh, and, you know, when I first joined my lodge and found out there were Orthodox, uh, you know, Russian and Greek Orthodox and Jews and Muslims. Uh, uh, during my time as master of the lodge, I was fortunate enough to raise uh, a Buddhist, a Zoroastrian, um, many different sects of Christianity. So I, you know, I quickly learned uh, that the, the tolerance within Masonry was something that's not just given lip service to. Um, and you can you can see that in just about any lodge meeting that you go to, uh, at least in Massachusetts, you will find pretty much somebody from every faith, um, just about at any meeting, uh, which is I think you know a true testament to the tolerance within the fraternity. Which volume of sacred law did you use? Uh, I used the Holy Bible when I became a Mason. Uh, you know, it's the the core. You know, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament are core to the Abrahamic faiths. And, and to David's point, uh, interesting enough, you know, when I had a candidate as master who was Zoroastrian, I, you know, beat myself up as trying to figure out what volume of sacred law we should have for him. And finally broke down because I couldn't figure it out. So I called him and was like, I'm sorry, I just, I don't know what we should do. And he's like, I don't care. He's like... <laughs> He's like, we don't really have a book that we would consider sacred to the point that we would swear on. So he's like, so the Bible's fine. I'm like, All right. Yeah. Um, to your point about some jurisdictions uh, um, being Christian only, um, and for anyone who isn't familiar with it, that's mainly countries that practice Swedish Rite Freemasonry. And that's largely, in fact, I think exclusively Scandinavian countries. Um, I think that's correct. Which are so, fairly homogeneous. So, and I I sat in a lodge in Norway 
that was in the Swedish Rite of Freemasonry, which is entirely Christian. And as a Jew, it wasn't a problem. They honored the fact that I was a Massachusetts Mason, and uh, there was no issue about me being present there, although if I were Norwegian soliciting for degrees, I would have to be Christian. Right. Interesting. Hi, Jeremy Gross. Hi, guys. I'm sorry, I just presided over the chapter. <laughs> and now I'm out of my tuxedo <laughs> in the in the library of the Masonic building. Jeremy, yeah. I hardly recognized you when you walked in. Oh, I know. I've lost 112 pounds since September. What is that, cocaine? Or what do you <laughs> have? A surgery, not quite so romantic. <laughs> 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 that will be edited. <laughs> yeah. I'm to it. I've got to head home. Wonderful to see all of you. Good to see you, Jeremy. Uh, Micah, what volume of Sacred Law did you use for your initiation? Uh, your they, they put a Torah out for me. Um, and I remember I was one of five. And so I, I just like, distinctly remember hearing the officers whispering, like, he's the one, put, put him next to the Torah, make sure he get it right. And uh, he's the Jew. <laughs> No, but I, I really around. appreciated it. On my second degree, however, they they put me in the wrong place, and I ended up going on the regular uh, Christian Bible. And they were several people apologized to me afterwards, and I said, you know, it's totally fine. It, it, it was open to an Old Testament book anyway, so you know, <laughs> so totally fine with that. Um, it really, it was. It, I, I was impressed, though, at almost at how upset they were that they had kind of messed up the alignment. If that makes sense. Hmm. Well, you know, no good. A simple truth about Freemasonry that I've learned over time: there is no such thing as a perfect degree, and no good lodge tolerates anything less than perfection in a degree. <laughs> 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 so on those two counts alone, I would be upset. Never mind the religious element. <laughs> I think that was my second degree. I also got walked into a chair at one point. So, you know, it wasn't, it, but it was still a great night. That's actually part of the degree. We, uh, yeah. <laughs> How? Your lodge room is massive. Uh, Didn't that happen <laughs> to you, Nick? <laughs> You think, Wait, no, I think you did. <laughs> but you don't know. <laughs> you think, all right. You know, there are guards placed at these gates and that chair, just in case. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, I've often thought that Masonic lodges, like mental hospitals, should be well padded in order to prevent accidents. You know, oh, I, like I, that. I cringe sometimes when I watch people getting marched around and they're like, oh, God. You're, you're so close. <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. Uh, when we did a we did a degree at um, the Scottish Rite in the in the commander's house, which they've since sold, and it was a very small small room, and so the the space available to walk people about was very confined. And I remember watching the can. I was senior warden at the time, and I remember watching the candidate go by, and thinking he's going to hit either the corner of the altar or one of the chairs. Mm. And just as I had that thought, he hit the chair. Just oh. like, I was just like, uh, yeah, it happens. So yeah. <laughs> there are parts of the fraternity in the United States that are exclusive to um, to, and the requirements vary somewhat depending on which which of the invitational bodies or, or other bodies we're talking about. For example, commandery is, um, although, you know, they're in less and less comfortable with it every day. Many would say commandery is Christian only, but then of course they would say as well um, that the wording of the requirement leaves it open to some individual interpretation. And I know some Jewish men who have joined commandery. You haven't joined Commandery Tech. I have not. Do you have any interest in Commandery? Uh, well, I did uh, for a long time, and I'm actually I'm I'm only uh, a member of the chapter. I have not joined the council yet, um, and I'm I'm getting there. Um, I said as soon as I was done in the East, I would finish my York Rite degrees, and then I accepted a Grand Lodge position. So you know, one of these days we'll get there. Um, <laughs> oh, we 
we have to call you right worshipful now, right? No, no, God, no, please. No, <laughs> please. Uh, yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not right worshipful. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm still just worshipful. Didn't mean to offend you, Ted. No, no, that's fine. Uh, somebody actually called me right worshipful today, and I was like, oh, oh. Yo, you shut your mouth right now with those rumors. <laughs> <laughs> no. People are around, they're going to start hearing stuff. Uh, so, I, you know, when I joined uh, chapter, uh, obviously, you know, one of the, the parts of the initiation of the chapter degree is to hand you an application to council and commandery. Uh, <laughs> And, and so I was interested in, and I was reading through and I got to the commandery degree, which says, you know, you must swear to take up the sword in defense of Christianity. And I was like, oh, um, huh. I'm, I'm not really sure how I feel about that, either generally or Masonically. Uh, so I was actually speaking to a friend of mine who at the time was the, the grand commander of the commandery in Massachusetts who told me, it's not an issue. You know, if you are interested, he said, you know, if anybody has a problem with it, I will stand up for you. You know, I will be your sponsor and, and I will, I will, uh, I will get you into the commandery, uh, which I thought was interesting. And, you know, generally, you know, if somebody asked me were I to take up the sword to defend Christianity, you know, I think generally the question would be, well, why? You know, um, if it's a, a general threat against religions in general, then sure, I'll take up the sword to defend Christianity. With, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, if you're talking about a crusade, well, you know, I might have an issue there. <laughs> uh, like the interesting thing was uh, I went on that premise and had several conversations with other members of Commandery, uh, whom shall remain nameless, uh, who were quick to point out that this person, i.e. the Grand Commander, uh, was wrong and that I would not be welcome as a member of commandery. Uh, and they, you know, made that very clear to me in no uncertain terms. And so ever since that time, I've kind of permanently had a bad taste in my mouth about commandery. Um, yeah. I, I, I find the bodies that have religious requirements beyond what masonry has to start. I, you know, I would feel less conflicted about that if there were a wider variety of such bodies. What do you mean a wider? A wider, yeah, variety. Yeah. Oh, so, I thought you meant like Caucasian. No, wider. Wider, wider. All, yeah. right. all right. So like if there was a requirement, if somebody existed for exclusively for Jewish men, if somebody I would, exists- I would join that in a second if that existed. <laughs> yeah, you know, interestingly, in New York, there was such an organization, um, and I've heard that it it is no longer so. It never really took off. There wasn't enough interest to keep it sustained, but there was briefly, an, evidently, an authorized um, working organization of Masonic organization exclusively for Jewish men. And I have no problem with that because I think that speaks to, you know, the diversity of the fraternity. The problem is, is that because in order to keep it going and in order to have a national structure and all the things we like to lay on to things in the fraternity that aren't necessarily essential to having an organization, but that seem to be what we want in a Masonic organization, um, it's hard to form such a body because you know, the predominant faith in the United States is Christian. And so that tends to be the kinds of bodies that are developed in the U.S. I doubt we'll ever have a Sufi exclusive organization. Uh, this is probably true. Uh, you know, you know the, the noble order of the whatever, whatever shrine is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to name a, a Sufi organization yeah. on the spot. No, no. You speak no. at the Noble Order. That's good. That's, That's good. good. Yeah. Sounds about yeah. right. Nope. Off to a good start. Whatever, whatever. Well, he did say he was a wandering Sufi. So. Yeah, so that's, that's right. That's the, uh, you know. Um, so, Micah, if, did you join Commandry? I did, actually, yes. Hmm. And no problem or how do you feel about that and what it helps that i think it helped for me that i joined 
Boston Commandery, which uh, I, it's the only Commandery I know anything about. And it had a number of Jews in it. I think if it was, and so when I was trying to decide if I was going to do it or not, um, knowing that there were other Jews already in that helped a lot. And that's because they're coming for you second. <laughs> <laughs> and I think for me, it was, I wanted the full to complete the story. If that makes sense. Like I wanted to see all of York, right. I had just done my chapter degrees. I had done council and it felt like there was this sort of third part that I wanted to see what it was all about. And I knew a lot of, Masons who I, you know, admire and have learned from were all in Boston Commandery. So it was something that um, I felt comfortable doing. Um, having said that, it's not, it's, I did my degrees and I still go and occasionally, but I can't see myself really get, I can't see myself ever getting in the line, if that would make sense. I don't think it would be a body that I would get actively involved in, but I don't feel actively excluded or anything like that. Hmm. Yeah, it's very similar to the experience I had in Scottish Rite, you know, as I, I went through, albeit the one day class, um, I was a little surprised when we got to the Rose Croix degrees and I was like, wow, there's some, there's some deep Christian stuff going on here. <laughs> um, and interestingly enough, that was the first body that approached me and said, hey, do you want to get in line? And I was like, I don't think I do. Yeah. Yes, I I, I, I I passed on the the chance to go to knighthood school, which did sound amazing. I believe that's what they the sort of whatever they called it in commandry was something mm. like that. That was like to teach you how to march and all of that. It was I, I I drew the line at that. Yeah, I you know I have often said, and it's a minority opinion, and there are very good, you know, great masons who are very good friends of mine who hate that I think this. But I think commandery, the York Rite would be better served if commandery were considered not a part of the progression of the degrees, but a separate side organization like the 147 other York Rite side organizations. <laughs> <laughs> and that, we, that it wasn't part of the joint petition and that people didn't treat it as if it's the summit of the York Rite because there is no continuity in the story there. It's mm. not like you're. It's not like you're learning about part of that Masonic tradition that starts in the that really starts in the second degree, and then carries through all the degrees of the York Rite, must um, until you hit Commandery. Commandery has its own separate storyline, and I get that our brethren returning from the Civil War wanted to dress up in Civil War naval uniforms and they wanted to play with swords and they wanted that experience and it became incredibly popular. And I love the Knight Templar story. I was a de Malay. I have that burned into my soul in some way. It's deeply appealing to me in that respect. But the York Rite would be better served if commandery was considered a side thing because I think some guys don't join chapter or don't, you know, get involved in chapter because they're like, I don't want to do commander. Mm. No, I think that's absolutely right. And I think it, it, it causes problems for the York, right? And I think it doesn't serve, it doesn't serve chapter and council well. And I, quite frankly, I think, you know, the, the Royal Arch degree and the Royal Master degree are to me two very important Masonic degrees for a complete understanding of of the story and if you miss those i'm not sure where you're going to pick them up there's a little bit of that tradition in the scottish rite in the southern jurisdiction degrees um or you know as we could say in the rest of the world outside the northern masonic jurisdiction degrees there's a little bit of that tradition in there but even there it, it's not as clear that it's not as it's not quite the same version and it doesn't hang with the lodge degree quite as well. But for some reason we've decided to make commandery so central to the York right that, that it really, and it doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit because of the religious requirement. However you want to you know, view that because of the language in the orders, 
and because the storyline is different. So that's my rant on Commandry. I also think it would be better for Commandry, frankly, because then you get the guys who really want to be in Commandry and not the guys who just think they have to be in Commandry. But I mean, think about all the people who say that they became Masons so that they could join the Shrine. Yeah. If you, yeah. If you could just join Commandry, you would probably get a whole lot of people who would become Masons just so they could join Commander. Yeah, I, um, I used to complain about people who said that they wanted, that they became Masons just to join the Shrine. And then I met a guy who did that and then became so impressed with Freemasonry that he's very active in his lodge, very involved in, as an officer in his lodge, will soon be master of his lodge, and um, is a great guy and a great Mason. So I've decided that I'm not as concerned about if they're joining to be Shriners as how we get them to be actual Masons along the way. Absolutely. I do note that Micah has gone casual on us, so. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did he undress on camera? Like nobody noticed? <laughs> uh, he's, he's just gone into the I mean, after I, hours I, gentleman I, pose with the Exactly. I did. I did undo the bow tie. I'm still in the three piece tuxedo, but uh, I figured it's after 10 o'clock. So I could allow myself uh, to loosen up the bow tie a little. Woo! Nice. So our buddy Skos um, said the Jewish order still exists. It's called the Order of Judas Maccabee. Sorry, the Order of Judas Maccabeus. And it's New York only, right? Shocks. I was going to ask if they have a Boston chapter. <laughs> well, you can create one. It, yeah, it, you know, Micah, it, it would not be the easiest thing in the world to do, but I have a hard time imagining a Grand Lodge telling a Jewish Mason that a uh, Masonic <laughs> organization that's recognized by another U.S. Grand Lodge <laughs> can't start. And yeah, yeah, I just have a hard time. So, you know, when you in your copious spare time. Yeah. You know, <laughs> He says it exists in New York, but it's trying to be brought back in Texas. So, I mean, if Texas is doing it, you're clear, in my opinion. <laughs> I like that. The the polls come there. There. Jewish Masonic community in Texas. I mean, there were a, a significant portion of my dad's lodge were Jewish men. Mm. Can I ask a question that can be edited out? Uh, <laughs> sure. Nick and David, are you in the same room? Yes, yes. Ah. Why? Because I noticed you each keep turning your head away from the camera to talk to each other. Because and I, didn't... I asked David, I only asked him for like $2,000 to re, to make his new office completely different and podcast friendly. There's an echo. I would soundproof the walls. I would get my, wow. own, my own desk in here. I mean. <laughs> he went to his own desk in my office. <laughs> I was going to say, simmer down there, Raj. Um, Talk about a man suffering from religious delusions. Yeah. <laughs> so here, let me. Have you not met David Riley before? Have you met David? So we have me, we have David's office, and then we have my Surface Pro laptop, a USB 3.0 hub, Ooh. GoPro recording as a backup recorder because my computer's just in case. Open. We have a. Oh Blue God, there's me. That uh, David and I are sharing. He has his laptop, and then he has himself but he's muted there so when he talks that's why it shows up my face but we're figuring it out don't i was just wondering besides the fact that you guys take turning to, towards each other to speak nick you moved earlier and there was a picture of raksha on this on the shelf and and i i mean i she's a wonderful dog but i didn't think that you also had a picture of her so <laughs> fun fact raksha is the only dog i've ever met in my entire life that does not like me really <laughs> yeah um, Raksha likes two people in the entire universe. You and Nathan. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> She's done. <laughs> and you know what? I understand that. <laughs> Can't falter for that. <laughs> you want I have a limited number of people I want to tolerate as well. <laughs> um, what brought this? Because if I recall, we wanted to do episode two for like six months. And then one day you messaged me and he's like, you're like, episode two, religious tolerance. <laughs> Set it up. And I was like, okay. And then at the end, you're like, I have a rant. 
Yeah, I think what happened was, um, well, there were a couple of things that happened. I had a conversation with a friend of mine who reminded me of uh, a grandmaster who will remain nameless um, issuing an edict that uh, prohibited a wide range of people. And I think he threw in words that he didn't know the meaning of <laughs> from becoming Masons, because one of the words that he included, he said no agnostics and no Gnostics. So if you don't, <laughs> you know, you're not allowed to join. But I think <laughs> given this, the Scottish right to priests in the Southern jurisdiction, I find it interesting that you would exclude Gnostics from the fraternity. That would be but, a problem. Yeah, but uh, he also, and you know, in fairness to the Grand Lodge in question, because people will Google and find it, um, it was not upheld by the next Grand Lodge session. So it is not the case. But he also excluded Odinists. Mm. What's an Odinist? Someone who worships the Norse god o Odin. Ooh. And my mother lodge has a member who is in fact an Odinist. Is he Norwegian or? No, he's, like he's just unique. I mean, I love him dearly, but whatever. So being a good secretary of a lodge, I sent him an email that was like, don't go to that state. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, what are you talking about? Well, I was like, it, well, actually, I think his line to me was that it, that sounds like generally good advice, but why <laughs> in particular? And so then I had to explain to him that he was currently prohibited from being a Mason in that jurisdiction. <laughs> but, well, uh, you know, to that, to that grandmaster's credit, he probably thought that agnostics were just Gnostics who went to A&M, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have no problem with banning guys who went to A&M from being members of the fraternity. That sounds like wisdom. <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, someone reminded me of that. And then um, I... Um, I had an experience at uh, a lodge recently where the context, the content of a particular um, charge seemed excessively Christian heavy. Oh, actually, I asked our friends about that. They says it's common. They all do it. Yeah, I didn't like that. I was surprised. So it's, yeah, you were... I'm just gonna repeat what you said, but yeah, it was it was extremely Christian, and even I was like, even me as a Christian, I was like, all right, dude, that's a little, it's hmm. a little much. I mean, you know, as the funny thing is, as a Christian, I think I found it more offensive because part of it is uh, I don't like having my faith pushed on other people because it makes it makes Christianity look bushy and bad. <laughs> and I think it devalues, I think it devalues the faith. And so it made me really uncomfortable. So I was thinking about that and that was sort of the genesis of wanting to talk about this topic. I wonder if I said, being pushing in your faith is definitely, definitely non-Anglican, so. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we figure if you don't already, what's the old joke? The, the, the priest gives a very evangelical sermon and the old matron of the church sails out at the end of the service, shaking his hand. And she says, that was a very fine sermon, Father, but don't you think everyone who needs to be Anglican already is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other um, the other version of that joke is that if they're not drinking sherry already, why would we give them part of our supply? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, does anyone else have anything that they want to to share at this point? Any experiences? Any thoughts? Uh, you know, I've actually I, I was thinking about it a bit since you and Nick first contacted me, and and I've actually had. I won't say a lot, but a handful of Muslim candidates um, and even, you know, some of the the offshoots of, of Islam that you can name on the liberal side, Yazidi and, and some of the other branches, um, ask what it is that makes 
Freemasonry uh, acceptable uh, to somebody who practices uh, the Muslim faith. Uh, and because they, you know, of course, you know, all they hear is kind of the hardline dogma from some of the more conservative Islamic countries, which are, you know, Freemasons are the enemy of the state. Uh, and that's, you know, generally because we teach democracy and free thinking, but, you know, oh, scary. Um, so I was thinking about, you know, the central tenets that we teach every Mason that joins the, the craft, uh, faith, hope, and charity. Um, and how those kind of dovetail with not only Islam, but also, the, you know, I would generally say probably any monotheistic and arguments could be made probably beyond that to certain faiths, but definitely the Abrahamic faiths in that, um, you know, faith we obviously have covered in the fact that, you know, to be Muslim, to be Jewish, to be Christian, you have to believe in God. Fairly easy. Hope in immortality is taught in at least two of the three Islamic faiths, I know, and Micah can correct me if I'm wrong, but I know there's the idea of the immortal soul in Judaism is debated among some of the schools of thought. I would say um, it's complicated. It is complicated, yes. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think about, uh, especially thinking about some of my, my friends and, and brothers who, for them, the, the month of Ramadan will start at the end of this month. And, and I always have the greatest sympathy for them when Ramadan falls during the summer, um, because dear God, it's a very long time between sunrise and sunset. Um, but right there in, in the month of Ramadan, you were taught as two of the basic pillars of Islam, hope and charity. Uh, you know, one of the pillars of Islam is the, the pillar of zakat, the idea that you must give to charity. It is, it is not an optional thing. It's not a, it's not a consideration. It is core to your belief. Uh, and both that and hope are taught specifically during the month of Ramadan when you are forced to learn what it is like to be without um, from the lowest member of the community to, uh, I won't say the highest members, because that would probably include some of the monarchy in the Middle East, and I don't think they practice that well, but um, <laughs> the idea that you will learn that from sunrise to sunset, you will not eat, you will not drink. Uh, if you are a smoker, you will not smoke. You will learn what it is to suffer. You will learn what it is to be without. Um, and at, at sunset, uh, when Suhoor happens, you learn how privileged you are um, and the hope that you can learn from that and the charity that is taught to you uh, are kind of core Islamic beliefs. Uh, and they dovetail very nicely with what the craft teaches. Um, so I often have told potential candidates or new members that who have struggled with the idea that you know, the, the tenets of, of Freemasonry and the tenets of Islam are in conflict. Um, and I basically explained to them they're no more in conflict than they are with the tenets of Christianity or the tenets of Judaism. You know, we are a non-religious organization for a very specific reason. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a faith-based organization, but we are not a sectarian organization. Um, because we take those principles and we practice them universally. Uh, which I think is, to David's rant earlier, I think is something that we should be screaming from the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. I think it's especially important in, in this day and age. You know, Freemasonry served as the, provided the shock troops for the Enlightenment and served as schools of the Enlightenment. And those enlightenment values are more important today than perhaps they've ever been since the time of the enlightenment. And that idea of religious tolerance, I think, is one of those core ideas that is needed in our society um, as, as much as it's ever been. Micah, do you have any summa summation to give? 
But before, Micah, before you start, I just yeah. want to let you know your ring is on backwards. But <laughs> uh, I believe the, the great David Riley told me that in Massachusetts, there is no particular tradition to which direction it, uh, it should be. That is correct. And he, and he has it on correctly, Brother <laughs> Harvey. <laughs> well, um, I guess in summation, I'd, I'll just say, I think Masonry and Judaism for me has just been a great thing. And I think in a lot of ways has made me, made my faith stronger since I became a Mason because it got me thinking more about it uh, um, and feeling a stronger connection to it. Um, I always tell, you know, new brothers who are, are people who are looking to join the lodge, it's, you know, I've gotten everything, everything I wanted to get out of masonry I have, and then more. And I think the part of the more is just that it has, I think, helped me with my own sense of being Jewish. I think it's just made it sort of even better, if that makes sense. Mm. Do you want to summarize for Christians, Nick? <laughs> Yes, Nick, speak for Christians. I keep seeing a lot of posts on the Freemasonry Reddit subpage of Catholics asking if they could join. There was one today. Did you, a bunch of Episcopalians were asking if they could join. I was like, where's David? Oh, I'll have to, I'll have to check in. Yeah. Um, I know my church that I go to in Florida is anti-Masonic. And, and it's a non-denominational Protestant church. And they even have books in their library on um, how, do you, how to talk to your husband about the lodge. Like it's not called Freemasonry, it's called the lodge, like capital. Um, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Me, dun, dun, dun. I think for me, and I've studied quite a few different religions and I love learning the mysteries of the past and of religions and all that. Um, I think Freemasonry helps me get in connection with God personally. I know a lot of other people feel that way. Um, I think it, for me, it helps me get a better connection to God, what we learn and teach in the fraternity myself. But I also think, and I, I mean, I know this for a fact from people who I've spoken to that I've said I used to be anti-Muslim, was one of them. I used to be anti-Jew until I joined the fraternity. And then I was actually a lot more accepting because I realized that we can all pray and we don't have to go into our own little, well, Christians pray, you have to say in Jesus' name or whatever. And we can do that. Um, and I think that's great because it brings us together in this world that's ripping each other apart. I think one of the things that I've learned from Freemasonry that has really strengthened my faith is a really deep connection to other people, um, a real love for my brothers. And seeing men over time when they're struggling and when they're strong, when they're up and when they're down, um, and loving them all through that. Mm. And I've never had, um, I've, I don't believe that you can, uh, you know, as a, as a typical Episcopalian, I don't think faith works well outside of community. And you, Freemasonry has become for me, um, you know, you hear about orthodoxy, orthodoxy is right thinking. There's also orthopraxy, which is right doing. And Freemasonry has become a big part of the orthopraxy of my faith. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a way that I connect with people. It's a way that I practice charity. It's a way that I practice that what charity really means in our ritual caritas, that unconditional love. That's a way that I practice it is through the fraternity. There's other benefits, but I would say that that's, that's the strongest way that Freemasonry has contributed to my faith. <clears throat> and with that. With that, I think we're done. We're just going to head on through to the outros. Anybody? Anybody else? No. No. Okay.
I'm going to get us a note from Micah. All right. So as a closing outro, and again, we're still working on this, so please just go bear with us. So good night, guys. Good night, good night and thank you night. so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. The fantastic photography on our website is courtesy of Brother Aaron Sherman. Our theme song is currently under development, but is composed by worshipful Christopher Duggan. Our website is maintained, curated, and lovingly tendered by myself. Essential canine supervision is provided by Raksha. The opinions expressed in this podcast and on our website are those of the individual contributors and do not represent the opinions of any lodge, grand lodge, or other Masonic body. Please visit our website at 3 distinctnoxorg You can also find us on all the usual social media platforms at 3 Distinct Knox. I'm Nicholas Harvey, and I'm incredibly thankful for the brothers that have made this podcast and my Masonic journey so rich, interesting, challenging, and fulfilling. I really hope 3 Distinct Knox has helped you make some daily progress in Freemasonry. Thank you for listening.